Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks. I feel a little nervous being surrounded by all these Razorbacks, but uh, I uh, had sort of post-traumatic stress when I got off the airplane and I saw these big hog heads uh, bring back a lot of memories. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be here. This is a wonderful uh, thing that we have with the, the Clinton School. I've admired it since it started, and um, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a great thing to have this in the South, and what, the idea that, that people are coming through this and going out in the country is something that is really, really wonderful. Um, as, as Austin said, um, the genesis of this book uh, was really uh, one that, that came out of uh, the 2012 campaign. Um, when I worked for Mitt Romney, we lost. Um, and I found myself, uh, after that, in that campaign, uh, after, and after the campaign, uh, thinking about a lot of things that uh, probably wouldn't have thought about if we had won. You know, I've done a lot of campaigns. I'd worked for President Bush when we had been fortunate enough to win. And I was never one of these guys who would have gone into government. Um, it's, not, it's not what I do. Some people can do both, campaigns and government, and do them well, but, but not me. I, I, if, if I had any utilitarian purpose, it was about the taking of Baghdad, not the, the running of Baghdad. Um, and it was always campaigns that drew me to politics, not the running of government. In that sense, I probably represent the worst of the American political system. Um, but that year, uh, in December after the November campaign, my father turned 95. Um, and I began to think that perhaps this rumor that we were mortal might be true. Um, and I started thinking about those things that you kind of ask yourself about what was really important in life. and. Uh, my father and I, when I had grown up in Mississippi, I grew up in Jackson, we've been fortunate enough to stumble upon this sense of, uh, of, of something that we could do together that was very special, which was go to football games, and particularly Ole Miss games. And at that time, Ole Miss played a lot of games at Memorial Stadium in Jackson. And we lived uh, close enough where we could actually walk to a lot of those games. Um, and it was something we did all the time I was growing up, and we tried to do it as much as we could, uh, you know, when I went away to college. And, but we both were really busy. You know, he had his, his career. I had, you know, was trying to build a career. And we never did it as much as uh, we would have liked. Then I realized that there was certain no reason we couldn't do this again and to go out and sort of grab time. So uh, in the fall of 2013, which would have been also your senior year, right? Um, we, uh, we spent the fall with my mom. Uh, the three of us went to all of the Ole Miss games. Um, not just the home games, we went to all of them except for the Texas game, um, which we said it was, it was an away game. We said it was too far to drive, though the truth was that we thought that Ole Miss was going to lose to Texas. And, um, it's a long drive back after you've lost. Um, but then Ole Miss won, and we were really sorry we didn't go. Um, and out of that book, uh, out of that experience, came this book, The Last Season. Um, it's really a book about uh, families and fathers and sons and sports, but about these two great uh, passions that were sweeping the South when I was growing up and how they're connected, which were college football and civil rights. And to a lot of people who aren't Southerners, I think the idea that these two were connected may seem strange, but it's something that, that fascinates me. Uh, I'm fascinated by the way that college football changed civil rights and civil rights changed college football. Um, the opening scene in this book is uh, the 1962 Ole Miss Kentucky game in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, which was, uh, a really uh, critical moment, I think, in, in Mississippi history and arguably the country's history. Um, it's at that game at halftime that Ross Barnett, the governor of Mississippi, came out at halftime in this extraordinary scene um, and delivered this speech, which was really a call for insurrection against the federal government. Um, my dad and I were there. Uh, 
and uh, we, we left at halftime. I, I never sort of understood why, though um, now I do. Um, and almost won that game. And in fact, went on to win all of their games. 62 was the last undefeated season that Ole Miss had and the last national championship season that Ole Miss had, um, which is in itself remarkable given what was happening. But the students left, and you can imagine that sort of um, incredible energy of a nighttime college football game, the, a team ranked number one in the country winning, governor going out calling, for resistance against the federal government, went back to campus, and 24 hours later, we had the riots uh, the, day, the night before James Meredith was to be uh, admitted into Ole Miss as a student. Um, and those riots took place right uh, in the heart of the Ole Miss campus, which is the Grove. I, I don't know how many of you have been to, to Ole Miss, but that, that Grove is it's really, uh, I think, a very special place in certainly Mississippi history, but, but sort of Southern history. You know, I think Mississippi's probably the most Southern state. I mean, where I grew up, people bragged about going north to Arkansas. And <laughs> it's the truth. And uh, Ole Miss is, I think, the most Southern university. And the Grove, uh, that sort of green space there in the middle of the campus, is where in 1861, the Mississippi Grays uh, mustered out uh, every student, they're all male then, but three who are sick, uh, joined the uh, Confederate uh, Mississippi Grays uh, Regiment to go off and fight the Civil War. They uh, led Pickett's Charge with 85% casualties. Um, and then it's where arguably that riot, I think, was the last pitched battle of the uh, Civil War in 62. I mean, within a week, you had over 30,000 troops in Oxford, Mississippi, which is just extraordinary to think about. And now, if you go to uh, an Ole Miss game, I went uh, to the Vanderbilt game uh, a few weeks ago, you know, it's, it's, the Grove is now heralded as the greatest pre-college or pre-game uh, sort of spectacle uh, it's not really tailgating because they don't allow cars there now, uh, but you can have 100,000 uh, people there before the game. And there's this ritual they have where the, the uh, team before home games, uh, a couple hours before the game, uh, they, comes in through buses, they get out of the buses, and then they walk through what we call, I think, uh, aspirationally, the walk of champions. Um, and uh, to, the, to the stadium. Um, and it's really a remarkable scene um, if you step back and you think about where it is and what's happening. Because the players now look a lot more like Mississippi. I don't know, they're 60 plus percent African American. You know, they have long hair, short hair. I mean, they look like Mississippians. And the Grove, though it's still predominantly white, is, it looks more and more every year a lot more like Mississippi. And they, they go right through uh, where the riots were, where they mustered out to fight the Civil War, past the Confederate War Memorial, which is all, to me, sort of mind-boggling, into the stadium. Um, and they're all mobbed by these these, these adoring throngs. Um, and it's, it's, I think, really uh, a, a remarkable moment to capture how much the South has changed and how the role that football has played in that. Um, and it's certainly not to say that we're perfect in any way. I mean, we're not home yet, but Today was the first day uh, that the students you know, had voted to take down the Mississippi flag, and it came down today. Right? Um, and I, I think what's fascinating about it is that in many ways, uh, college football in the South played a similar role as rugby in South Africa. It was the first time that blacks and whites cheered for each other 
and really meant it. And I think once you do that, it's very difficult to go back. You know, when you think about it, there's a lot written, uh, interestingly, a lot of interesting stuff written about how increasingly our lives are, are sort of lived separately, you know, going back for 20 years to the famous book Bowling Alone, and now with social media where, you know, we can have best friends we've never met on Facebook or something, you know. But when you go to a game, you, you, it's perfectly acceptable to turn to a stranger next to you and hug them. And it happens all the time. This is a very odd moment when you think about it, but it's a very, com it's, it, in, in its commonness, it's sort of odd. Um, it's a sort of release of, mom of, of, of emotion. And after a game, if you lose, you know, people will walk out sort of consoling each other. And it's very rare to find this sort of, you know, public uh, uh, sort of moments of, uh, of emotion that are shared these days. Um, I went to the Ole Miss Alabama game uh, this year. Uh, my father and I both went. Um, he, he uh, I was there to do a book signing uh, at this amazing bookstore called Alabama Booksmith, which if you're ever in Birmingham, they only sell signed books. It's, it's like a book temple. You have to go there, it's amazing. Um, but my father, you know, it was a late game, started like eight something. And my father had this premonition that Ole Miss was gonna lose. So he stayed in the hotel and I went with this friend of mine, Warren St. John, who wrote this great book called Rammer Jammer which is about going around to uh, Alabama games. He's from Birmingham with that crazy RV crowd. And uh, Warren, who's the world's nicest uh, person, had gotten us tickets in this fancy box with this uh, very nice guy who's a trustee at the University of Alabama. And I have to say, I, I, after that game, I've never seen such unhappy people in my life. I mean, if you're an Ole Miss fan, for better or worse, you, you've lost before. You sort of... <laughs> This, this is something, this is an experience which has some familiarity, you know, you sort of, you can fall into a, a space that you know. They, they were, I'd say that they were very, very nice. I mean, perfect strangers outside, I was in my old Miss gear, everybody was nice. Uh, but they were really, really shocked. And Warren, even though he lives in Birmingham, was staying that night, um, he became very close to this tribe of RVers, and he was spending the night in an RV with one of his tribe members, which, as he says, they keep making them park further and further away from uh, the stadium because the university's embarrassed by him. So I drove Warren, who's a shell-shocked guy, out to this place where they were at camp, and all these RVers were parked in front of the, you know, had their chairs out in front of their RVers, these Alabama fans. They were all staring into space. They looked like pictures of, you know, guys you'd see come back from Vietnam, you know. They were, and uh, I, I went out with Warren because I wanted to meet them. Uh, cause, you know, some of these same characters he'd written about in his book. And, um, you know, uh, Warren said, can I, you know, anybody got a drink? And this guy said, you know, Warren, there's not enough whiskey in the state of Alabama for tonight. <laughs> I thought it was fantastic. But, the, you know, the, those, those sorts of, uh, of, ex of experiences, I think, are very difficult uh, to find outside of this. Um, in 1962, uh, Ole Miss uh, was uh, an, an all-white team. It was the last year that won the national championship. Um, and then you had this, in 63, you had uh, the, the terrible, uh, you, you had the, the killings of, uh, of Medgar Evers and the subsequent trials. And this will just give you a sense of how far we've come. You know, uh, there were three trials to kill uh, 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 the uh, Byron de la Beckwith, who everybody knew had killed uh, Medgar Evers. And they were all uh, uh, hung juries. And the prosecutor, who actually lived down the street from us, um, Bill Waller, who was this sort of country lawyer who had come to Jackson, really did try to convict Byron de la Beckwith. Um, 
And Byron de la Beckwith, based on the publicity that he got as the non-convicted assassin of Mary then ran for, people forget this, he, he ran for lieutenant governor in the state of Mississippi. And his slogan was, I still have one of his posters, a straight shooter. And he came in fourth. And that's how far the state has come. And it's, it's, when you think about it, this was not very long ago. Um, later, the state elected Bill Waller governor, I think, in sort of a, a paroxysm of, of guilt. Um, and it, it really I th uh, w was a, a moment, I think, where the, the state was sort of torn apart and this thing called football was something that they clung to in that 62 season. Um, and it's, it was, there's always this question of why is it that college football uh, is so uh, important in the South? You know, this is something, like when I go around, I've gone around, you know, outside of the South talking about this book and everything, I always get this question. And I think it's a really interesting question, and I don't think there's one answer for it. But part of it is, I think, that for, at a time when we weren't very good at a lot, this was something that we were good at. And there was sort of a natural tendency to grab onto that. And I think also that there's something um, that is, uh, appeals to Southerners about the violence of football that is sort of something that is uniquely Southern. And there's something about the communities of small towns in the South, that kind of Friday Night Lights quality that really appeals to uh, Southerners. Unlike pro football, where, you know, these seem to be superheroes, people that are beyond us, you know, you could have these moments where people who we know could play these games and go and do this. And the fact that in the South, we, for a long time, we never had professional teams of any sort. Um, and it, it, one of the things that, uh, that really uh, struck me as soon as I left the South was this deep, deep uh, gulf between how Southerners felt about college football and non-Southerners felt about college football. And this was something that uh, is, is just difficult to grasp. I, I moved to New York uh, when I, I, after college, and I lived in New York for years and years before I knew anyone who I think was not from Mississippi. Everyone at that time left the South. And at that, there was that expression that was coined by a Mississippi professor, the Magnolia Curtain. And when I grew up, and there's a lot of this in the book, there really was a sense that there was this world that was beyond Mississippi, and that it was out there, and that you needed to, to go out there to succeed. You needed to, to it was there. I think actually if you read a lot about Bill Clinton, he felt that here in Arkansas, that there was this. But really in Mississippi it was more than anything. You know, there was one newspaper chain, uh, one family that owned the newspapers, the Hederman family, uh, and a lot has been written about them. But to say that they were not enlightened on the issues uh, would be a great understatement. And there was one predominant television station, WLBT, in Jackson which is the only station in the history of the country that has had its, had its license taken away for racism. And these are the, were the two dominant sources of information in the South, I mean, in Mississippi, when you grew up in the era that I did. And it, that, that sort of sense that there was this other world out there. Um, so I just wanted to read a little bit from, if I could, uh, uh, of, of what it was like when I went to New York and first uh, experienced people who were not in love with football. The love of college football and its importance in life schemes are natural for a Southerner, but difficult for the uninitiated to grasp. When I first moved to New York City in the 1980s, it was not a happy time in the city's fortunes. Subways resembled filthy, graffiti-covered prison cells. Everyone talked about crime the way Alaskans talked about bears or ski patrollers discussed avalanches. But I loved it. 
Like generations of expats in a foreign land, I fell into a crowd of fellow countrymen, Southerners, and mostly Mississippians. They were everywhere. It was years before I had any close friends in the city who weren't Southern. In retrospect, that seems sort of depressing, but it troubled me not at all in the moment. The crime, the post-apocalyptic subways, the never-ending hunt for decent apartments that had perplexed every wave of New Yorkers since the judge. That all seemed part of the assumed rigors of big city life. It was to be expected, and complaining would have been like paying lots of money for a trip to the rainforest and grousing it was wet. That was New York. It was how the city worked and people lived. But every fall weekend, we would slide into a deep, predictable funk. We wanted to watch football, real football. At some point before each weekend, a depressing series of phone calls would commence among Southern expats over the scarcity and quality of the football options on New York City television. This was all pre-cable, pre-satellite. Holy Cross versus Harvard, can you believe it? My high school played better football. <laughs> it was much as I imagined growing up in a culture with wonderful distinctive food, India or the Sichuan province of China, and moving to a drab place where the only options were awful strip mall restaurants. They were all the more insulting for their claims to authenticity real Indian or genuine Chinese. They call these sad Northeastern college efforts football, but it was hardly a creature of the same species. Once a few of us dragged up to see Columbia play and we left before the half. It wasn't just what was happening on the field, it was the entire experience. The few students who condescended to come seemed more interested in the mocking hipness of playing at being football fans. Some actually read books during the game. This was like bringing a six-pack to church to get through the sermon. <laughs> like communion served to atheists at the Joyce Kilmer rest stop on the New Jersey Turnpike, a friend described it, as we rode back on the subway. Another friend was so depressed, he flew home the next weekend for the Ole Miss LSU game and never came back. <laughs> I didn't blame him at all. When there was a good game on television, and good meant that it had to involve a top Southern, preferably SEC team, We'd gathered in one of our small apartments and stare at the screen, each of us homesick in a different way. It wasn't just that we missed going to the games. We missed being fans who could find comfort in the presence of other fans. When you showed up at an Ole Miss Alabama game or an Auburn Alabama game, life's complicated choices were reduced to a binary definition. You were for one team or the other, and whom you were for was pretty much all anyone needed to know. It was an identity that superseded all others. Most of us had come to New York because we believed on some level that we had no choice. It was both a test of who we were and a way to define who we might become. It wasn't a fear of failure at home that drove us to New York, but a fear that success at home might be all too satisfying. The expats in my crowd had no illusions about the South. We were scornful of those we deemed professional Southerners, those living in New York who tried to define themselves by some pretense that they came from a more genteel than cultured world. But all of that changed on fall Saturdays when we would gather in a self-congratulatory self orgy of Southern boosterism and share the loathing of the Northeast brand of football. It gave us an opportunity to be smug, a joyful rarity for us in New York. But most of all, it was an affirmation that though we may come from a not so perfect spot, we believed in something larger than ourselves that made us better than ourselves. In a confusing world, this festival of Southern football was a constant that rarely disappointed. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Stu. Uh, let's, uh, let's take some questions. Uh, does anyone... Uh, Raise your hand and we'll get the microphone. We can even to. talk about politics. It's okay. Yeah, he said we could talk about politics. So, Rex, you can ask that question. Thank you. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts about how Chucky Mullins helped with racial. Yeah. And also, too, uh, Bay McCarthy. Could you talk about uh, him and the bus trip out of Mississippi to play uh, segregate or integrated teams? Yeah, the, does everybody know the Chucky Mullins story here? It, it's uh, one of these wonderful, sort of tragic stories. Um, I, I think uh, 
the embrace of Chucky Mullins is something that is very moving um, and powerful. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's difficult, I think, um, to really uh, navigate these waters. Because on the one hand, you, you, you don't want to take a tragedy and use that tragedy toward a, a purpose um, to prove that uh, race uh, no longer matters, because of course it does. Um, you know, James Baldwin, who I've, I've been reading a lot of James Baldwin, like, you know, he, he talks a lot about the normalization of race, trying to reach a place where race would be uh, unobserved and that that normalization would be. And I think that um, just in uh, the past few years uh, you, you've seen I think a difference in the way the Chucky Mullins Award is given to it's given to a player who represents the spirit of Chucky Mullins, I guess is how they describe it, a sort of never, never quit, never die spirit. Um, and I think that people at a certain time, I would imagine, and Austin could speak to this better than I probably, thought of Chucky Mullins as an African-American football player at Ole Miss who had this terrible tragedy and died. I imagine now that they think about that a lot less and he's more an Ole Miss football player. Um, I think that's, and, and I, I suspect, you know, in 10 years, that'll be much more the case. Uh. Abby. Thank you. I'm Abby Olivier. I went to Ole Miss and I'm a Clinton School grad and now work here. Thank you for coming. Um, no, no, congratulations. In college, I studied Southern culture and I heard you say the word identity a lot which is something I'm interested in, you know, uh, Southern identity and clearly football is part of the Southern identity. And recently, of course, we have still working with controversies about the Confederate flag. It's interesting to me that a lot of people in the South laud and worship and praise football players who are the same players saying that the flag is offensive to them. And I'm sure you've experienced this paradox in your work life and your you know, personal life, going to football games, how have you kind of grappled with that or, or, or what have you seen from that? And um, do we, are, are we close to making some progress at Ole Miss or do you think we have a ways to go? Well, you know, that's, I'm really glad you talked about that. Um, I, I, I'm not sure at what point I realized that the Confederate flag was something other than a symbol of Ole Miss. Because when I grew up, it, that's all, I mean, I was eight, nine, 10 years old falling in love with Ole Miss football. I just thought it was this Ole Miss football thing. And, you know, at every game, they would roll out what they build as the world's largest Confederate flag. I always wondered what the second largest was. Um, and, you know, the, the players would run out behind Colonel Reb. And the band, until, what, six, seven years ago, would dress in Confederate battle gray. Um, and uh, I can remember uh, at a certain point, this began to dawn on me when I had a teacher who had gone to state and she also had a Confederate flag in our classroom and I found this very confusing. Um, and I began to ask questions about this. Um, it was like, well, you know, that's something else besides, really. Um, it's, it's really, uh, Remarkable, I think, when you think that we just had a summer of Confederate flag in America. What would have been if Ole Miss had not gone through this period? And I think that Robert Kayak, the chancellor of Ole Miss, deserves tremendous credit and the sort of larger community. And, and uh, these things are never easy. And I don't know when you were at Ole Miss, but when, if you were there when this was happening. Um, I imagine it was, it was hard um, and sort of unimaginable that you could take these symbols away. Um, and still this whole bear thing is never really taken. <laughs> I always feel sorry for the person in the bear suit. Um, 
But if, if Ole Miss hadn't done that, think what it would be like now. I mean, this summer. I mean, that the school would be torn apart. Um, and they're still going through, uh, you know, like this vote. And there's a question, when I was on Ole Miss campus, there was uh, a discussion about changing Confederate Drive, even though it's named Confederate Drive, apparently, because it goes to the Confederate Cemetery. So it's an interesting, I mean, it is a Confederate Cemetery. It does go there. So, I mean, probably it should be called the Civil War Cemetery Drive, not the Confederate Drive. Um, but one thing I think about uh, that I give Ole Miss a lot of credit for, and I, I didn't go to Ole Miss, by the way. You know. um, my father did, my grandfather did, my mother did. Um, but I, I think that it's really tried to grapple with these questions. And I think that there's a special responsibility for a place like Ole Miss to grapple. And I think there's a special responsibility for Mississippians and Southerners to grapple with this, probably more Mississippians than anybody else. And, you know, it's very difficult to have any kind of public conversation about race. And it, it, it rarely goes smoothly. And it's rarely without awkwardness. Um, but that's not a reason not to do it. It's a, probably a reason to do it. And we see it with the whole Black Lives Matter conversation, which I think is one of the more awkward, important conversations that we're having. Um, and I, I give, I think Southerners have, you know, uh, more so than a lot of Northerners come to grips with at least the f acknowledgement that it was to be discussed and to be dealt with. Now, before we go into another sports question, I'm going to ask this question because I've, I've been wanting to ask this. You know, I follow this guy on Twitter. And for those of you that follow him on Twitter, you will notice that over the past few weeks he has engaged in this wonderful discussion with the real Donald Trump on Twitter. Stu versus Donald on Twitter. It's fascinating to watch. So, Stu, would you, would, you, would you analyze at this stage for us, you know, you know this like the back of your head, the, the 2016 lineup right now, how you see it uh, and how you think it's going to play out if you can guess? Um, well, the whole, this whole Donald Trump thing. So strange. Um, I wrote this piece for the Daily Beast, uh, which I write a column for him now and again. Um, where I made the case, uh, and you know, sometimes you write, arg you write columns just to be argumentative, you don't really believe it. I actually really believe this, um, that Donald Trump um, won't go all the way to the ballot, that he'll withdraw before Iowa. Um, my, my thinking being that, you know, in, in Donald Trump's world, the greatest put down is to be a loser. And what do we know about most people who run for president? They lose. Um, so why would a guy, you know, who's a business success, uh, who is obsessed with it, his brand, um, risk uh, going from being a business success to a political loser? Um, and, you know, I think th the other thing is, you know, he's someone who enjoy does what he enjoys. God love him, you know. But what do we know about running for president? It's the least enjoyable experience that adults voluntarily enter into. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that a lot of people have been drawn to Donald Trump kind of in the way life imitates high school. He's been having fun. It's fun to hang out with people who are having fun. I think when it's not fun, it won't be fun to hang out with him. And I think you got a little taste of this this week when you started seeing numbers of him uh, when he was, you know, uh, going down in Iowa when he was sort of lashing out. Um, the, the idea that Donald Trump would win, everything we know about politics has to be wrong, and I don't think it is. I, you know, I look at Donald Trump and these people sort of as like a, you know, uh, internet boom where you say, this time it's really different, the economy's different. It never is. <laughs> um, so I, I don't think the Republicans are going to nominate anyone who has not been elected to office before. So that would rule out Trump, uh, Carson, and Fiorina, all three of whom I think are very different. I think Carson and Fiorina are, are serious, interesting uh, individuals. I, I don't think that they'll be nominated or elected president. Um, 
So then you're down to the, the other folks. Um, you know, my theory of the race is not particularly profound, but to win, you have to win. So you look at those first four states, who's going to win Iowa, who's going to win New Hampshire, who's going to win South Carolina, who's going to win Nevada. I think that uh, those are going to be uh, functional playoffs. I don't see why um, if you're in third or fourth place in Florida or, or subsequent states, why losing the first four states would propel you forward. I think that you will be seen as having lost those first four states and you won't be in the race. So, I, you know, the question I would say is who's going to win Iowa, who's going to win New Hampshire, who's going to win South Carolina and Nevada? Uh, right now, I would say probably Carson or Cruz will win South Carolina, or uh, win Iowa. And, now, you know, another thing is we always get to talk about percentages. It's easy to get hung up in that. Look at the hard numbers. Uh, not many people vote in these things. You know, you can actually get nominated for president with about the same number of votes it takes to get elected to Congress. It's just kind of mind-boggling. If you win Iowa and New Hampshire, you're going to win. Um, and say you can win Iowa with 30,000 votes on the Republican side. Um, that's not a whole lot more than vote the student body at the University of Texas. Um, and Iowa and New Hampshire, you can win with 45,000, depending. Um, it's not a lot of people. So the difference between first and third in Iowa could easily be 3,000 votes. So, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really interesting. Um, so uh, I don't, I, I think Cruz or Carson are probably best suited to win there. Um, I, New Hampshire, I really don't have a feel for. You know, in the Romney campaign, uh, Romney came in second in 08 in New Hampshire, and we really analyzed why he lost to McCain. And wh where he lost was really up north, and you, you've been up there. Um, and you know, all these towns that, you know, McCain would get 38 votes, Romney would get 28. And we did a lot of research, spent a lot of time there. And it was really that they knew McCain better. You know, McCain had run in 2000. He'd spent a lot of time there. It wasn't that they didn't like Romney. Romney had high favor. They just knew McCain better. So he said, okay, well, look, that's something you can fix. Spend time there. So Romney did over 100 town halls in New Hampshire between announcing for president in June and the New Hampshire primary. And we always treated losing New Hampshire as sort of an existential threat. Um, I don't see anybody treating New Hampshire with that seriousness except for Chris Christie. Uh, and now Kasich has gotten in. Um, I, I think New Hampshire wants to be treated, taken very seriously. And, um, you know, no one knows that better than Bill Clinton. And, you know, one of the factors that I think is really different about this year is uh, Iowa is February 3rd this year, whereas before it was like January 3rd. And I think that's a big, big factor because, you know, no one wanted to focus on this stuff over Christmas, which you kind of had to. Now you've got an excuse not to focus on it. And, you know, billions of dollars have been spent trying to get people to buy Christmas presents and, you know, early without much success. So I suspect that people are really going to focus on this kind of when they wake up with hangovers like January 2nd. So I think in January there's going to be a lot of movement. Uh, and the real race is going to begin. It's a question is who's going to still be in that real race, would be my thought. And I also think that Bernie Sanders is going to beat Hillary Clinton in Iowa and New Hampshire, by the way. Yes, sir. Wait for, wait for the microphone. Ah, yeah. Can Jeb Book come back? Um, we were talking about this earlier, you know, I really, I, I worked for his brother in both races, and I've known Jeb a long time, and I, I really like Jeb. I think he's a really interesting, complicated, in a good way person. Anybody who converts to Catholicism in their 40s has a lot of interesting stuff going on. Um, yes, he can come back, definitely, absolutely. Look, I, I was part of the brain trust that took a 65-point lead into New Hampshire for his brother, and we lost by 19, which <laughs> you have to really, really work at that. Um, so, sure, I mean, we, we, were, we got off the plane in South Carolina after losing New Hampshire in arguably the most humiliating defeat in modern political history, and we were 20 points down in South Carolina, and we came back. So, uh, sure, yeah. 
uh, you know, I, I, I often say no one can get elected, nominated for president without being humiliated. And it's how you deal with that humiliation that is the question. And uh, the system is designed to humiliate you. And that's probably not a bad thing. You're running for president of the United States and it tests your temperament. Um, it, 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 you know, there are a lot of pe people who criticized Romney and criticized the campaign, a lot of Republicans did, and I get that. But now that they're out there running, I think they get a sense of how difficult it is. You know, the, the, the difficulty of running for president is so monumentally different than anything else in politics. I mean, I think it's like from junior high to the pros. And it looks the same, you know, you call them candidates, they go out, they ask for votes, everything, but it's entirely different. And just the pressure on the candidates and the staff is so uh, different. And it's worse every cycle. Now every person is a reporter, you know, has a camera. Um, and reporters are filing seven, eight stories a day. Um, and it's... Yeah. It, it, the, the pressure. And on staffs, it's incredibly hard. You know, you were, I do a lot of governor's races, Senate races, you know, you screw up, nobody really notices. In a presidential race, when you screw up, everybody knows. So you go to the gym to get away from it, you, you know, you're like on the television, they're talking about what idiots you are. You know, I mean, you just can't get away. Like, you know, your mom calls you and goes like, what were you thinking? You go like, Jesus <laughs> Christ, <laughs> give me a break. Um, and, you know, it takes, a lot of stability to deal with that. Um, you know, in, in Mitt Romney's case, uh, he was very good at that. He's a very stable person who um, had done a lot of things in his life and at his core was a very uh, happy person. Um, and uh, George Bush was too. Um, the idea that he would lose was not a terrifying thought to him. Um, so, you know, we'll see, we'll see. I do, I will say, I do find the fact that, that Bernie Sanders is doing so well to be absolutely fascinating. You know, we've had a lot of socialists run before, but none have done as well as Bernie Sanders. And I think it's, I think it's overlooked in its importance, particularly in light of what's happening around the country. I mean, you look at what happened in Canada, you look at what happened in England where the Labour Party nominated socialists. And I mean, the, the Bernie Sanders who s says that he's not a capitalist, is doing so well. I think it's extraordinary. And I, I've been to a couple of Bernie Sanders things, you know, and, I, and I've uh, spent a lot of time in Vermont. And these people who are for Bernie Sanders, they know a lot about Bernie Sanders. And I think it is really, really, a, I think it is a big moment in, in politics. I doubt he'll be the nominee, uh, but I think it's really important. All right, any other questions? Let me conclude before we sign this. I'm going to read this from the book. This is a conversation with Stu and his dad. This is his dad starting out. I guess next year this game is at Arkansas. I nodded. Yep, Fayetteville. He nodded. I don't know how many more of those hog fests I have left in me. <laughs> he smiled wistfully. This was something that had gone unspoken, that maybe these games were our last time together. Surrounded by hogheads and rebels and yelling our hearts out for young men on the field. It's a long drive to Fayetteville, I said, and that stadium is always terrible. All those maniacs yelling pig suey. <laughs> terrible, he agreed. But I'll tell you what, I said, putting my arm around him. I'd love to go to any game with you anywhere, anytime. Even Arkansas? You bet. I'd like that, he said, giving my shoulder a squeeze. I'd like that a lot. The last season, Stu Stevens. Thanks a lot.